announced. It was really, uh, there were no young men in the office or anything. These are all shipping and brain men. In their middle age, I'd say, I'm sure a lot of them are gone by now, and because they didn't live as long as our men are living today. And we all stood there. I, I, my father had a big radio in the office, and we listened to President Roosevelt. And uh, he sounded just like you hear when it's repeated. And, um, and wasn't there in those days something that was really interesting? Liquor. I don't think we had, we didn't have prohibition, but you couldn't buy a drink like at the Olympic Hotel or anything, because when we'd go out on dates or something, one of the fellows would have to bring a bottle. And I remember one time we went dancing at the Olympic Hotel, and you know, it's always a huge group of us, and there's always scotch or gin or whatever anybody wanted. And I was trying to figure out, when did we not have to do that again? And we got liquor stores. I'm trying to remember because 19, what, 39 was a... Uh, um, no, 41 war was declared. But December. I mean, prohibition started in what, 39? Or was it earlier than oh, that? Oh, no, it was way back when, I think. Oh, yeah, back in my grandmother's day, wasn't it? I just didn't. No, men could go into bars. Ladies never went. But men could, but then there was prohibition in this country. When was it? Yeah. Do some research, go to the library and find out because that was one thing. Because one time my father had all of the Portland shipping clubs, steamship club, and they were big. I didn't bring their pictures, they were all in tuxes and things. And there was a couple of, it was when my dad was with Yamashita. And um, there always was a Japanese gentleman that I'm sure my dad brought with him. And um, my dad left Yamashita prior to the war by several years because um, they elected him. First he was president of the exchange, not working there, but president because they had a huge group that all paid money in to support this exchange for the grain and the shipping news and all the, uh, those other two fellows in the picture were statisticians and they just kept everything. As I said, way back, they found files back to the 1800s. And, um, so um, they, somebody wanted a bottle. They had come in from on leave. And so I always knew where the liquor was for the shipping club. So I'd ask my dad. I was 21. I was over 21. And because I'm 78 now, and I'll be 79. But I'd call my dad, or if I saw him, because I worked for him for quite a while. Nobody knew that I was his daughter because we didn't look alike particularly, and I always referred to him as Mr. Semple. And so we kept it very businesslike. And um, so I could always call my dad and say, Dad, can we borrow a bottle? And he kept the door locked. He'd tell me where the key was. He was also an arbitrator during the um, steamship strikes, the um, uh, stevedore strike, Harry Bridges, does that name ring a bell? He's got a chair. Say, you've got to do some reading. <laughs> uh, this is the stuff that I've grown up with. Harry Bridges was head of the Longshoremen Strike, uh, I mean, the Longshoremen Unions. And um, it was really a, really a bad one. And it was up and down the whole Pacific coast. And they asked my father to be an arbitrator. And one day I went into my dad's private office. It was in the back of the whole exchange. And um, his door was always open. And I went in and I pulled the drawer open. His top right hand drawer, I remember pulling that open to get something. And there was a revolver. And I flipped and I said, Dad, what in the heck is that gun doing in your drawer? He said, I never know who's going to come in. And But it was quite a compliment to him. And when we would go out to lunch sometimes, uh, we'd be walking. Now, they, their office is on Fort, was on 4th Avenue. It's not anymore, um, which was kind of one of the lower streets, streets below 4th Avenue, like 3rd, 2nd, and 1st. It was really down along the waterfront. And we'd be going someplace, Dad, and I'd be walking up the street. To, they had a big farmer's market up there, and I'd probably were walking. And we'd hear somebody whistle. 
and we'd stop and my dad would look around because it was usually a longshoreman who knew him. And they have a certain whistle and he would stop and wave to them or he'd spot somebody then that he knew. And I was always thinking that was kind of neat, you know, to have. And it said in these articles that I was going through that I hadn't read for ages that he had done Super, I knew it had been a supercargo. Now there's a very smooth remark, a smooth name to it. Because one of my friends out at Sahali, her husband does this, but it's got a much smoother little name to it. And I said, oh, you mean he does supercargo? That's where they load the ships. They make out big scale deals. Uh, they usually have artist ability. I, I, I think of my dad's plans. I'd see him come home at the dining room table and just roll out this. And my half-brother turned out to do all the layout work for Myron Franks for their advertising. Mm -hmm. He came up from California, so there was art ability there. But my dad, uh, very interesting, and he was a chef. I mean, he'd done cooking, which I didn't know he'd done it in any place. But he was known for his cooking in Portland, and one of those articles that I have at home, maybe, um, um, Mary Cullen, the home ec thing for the paper. And they got his recipe, I know, on Taglarini, and they also got one on Chipino, which is like Bula Bay, only that's French, Chipino's Italian. Huh. My father learned to do this when he was living in California sometimes, so don't ask me. Well, now, what's interesting about your dad is that, that prior to the war, he was dealing with a Japanese... He was. I have things in my house. Um, I have my father's Harry coat, which my I, my son asked me. My son is 47, and he said to me, "Well, he's the one that likes all this old stuff." And he said he's the CEO of his company, works for Chinese interests. He just left them, and they're all in a state of shock. He's joining another Australian firm, and uh, that, they're going back. They're leaving, we're all leaving. I'm coming home the second, and they're driving the rental car over to LAX and catch the 930 flight to Melbourne. It's a direct flight now, and that's, and they can go business class. So huh. I always go the other, but it doesn't bother me any. But yeah, he, um, he did very, well, as you see in that picture, he was very serious. He, uh, they liked him, he had a lot of personality. Uh, the shipping fraternity and grain fraternity. I have a picture of him at home. It's my favorite picture. It's just a small. I have a copy of it in a scrapbook. He's in his full tux at one of these dinners, and Governor Snell of Oregon uh, was telling him an off-color joke. They all used to love and tell my father, because you never heard my father tell any dirty jokes, but he knew all the answers, the punchline, and it drove him nuts. And they would go back to New York or go down to New Orleans or down to San Francisco, and they would head right back to my father's office and say, I've got a joke you do not have the answer to. And he would come right up with the answer, how he did it, and where he heard him, I don't know. But he never talked to him at home. But this was a standing joke around the shipping circles. And that's like that picture when he's looking at something. I've got some with fish. He was a fisherman. We built. They built their home on the Clackamas River, and he put in, this is before he hit 60, he put in um, 10 acres in filberts, and you know, that's a big, high, expensive crop in Oregon. That's how he was going to return, I mean, retire. He couldn't, you know, they didn't have retirements in those days, unless you made a lot of money. And I would say he's middle class, and he'd lost a business, and but just a wonderful person and very well known. He had a huge uh, Knights Templar. <laughs> I was thinking about that this morning when I was making my bed, that they had a beautiful Knights Templar, which is an offshoot of the shrine, al uh, shrine, the Shriners, and then the Masons. Remember though, you probably, have you ever yeah. had any family that belonged to the Masons and they went into the Shriners? The Knights Templar were the uh, more of the religious in with these funny hats with a, they gave him a, oh, it was the names that he had that were honorary pallbearers, and he died very suddenly. But he knew this war was coming. He could tell. And the Japanese consul always gave us gifts. And one of the things, my dad could order anything on the ships. 
In fact, my half-brother, when he was in high school, came up and joined us in Portland, and my dad sent him out on all of these freighters, the different ones, whether they were U.S. or Panamanian or whatever flag. They weren't Japanese ships necessarily. They were usually something else. And all he had to do was polish the brass in the captain's cabin. And he got all these fabulous trips. Well, he made one big mistake. He, when he graduated, he wanted to come up to Oregon. And he opened his big mouth, the big tennis player, and he wanted a convertible. My father saw all the guys coming out of college during the Depression who couldn't get jobs. They were working on gas stations and doing a lot of menial work because no, there were no jobs. There were soup kitchens. And so, never, needless to say, John didn't get to go. He is still alive. Someday I'll go down, and, and I haven't seen him since I was 10 years old. Huh. And he's just 10 years older than I am, so that makes him 88. But I keep checking at the library every once in a while, and he's still alive. And I think he'd probably drop over dead if I ever showed up. Because <laughs> there was family's problems there, you know, and that just, uh, I just stayed out of it. <laughs> but um, one of the th two things he must have asked for, we had a lot of lacquerware too, and mother loved oriental furniture. Lots of brass, a lot of teak. And our whole home out there at the Clackamas was all done in Oriental. I did not appreciate it. I could have cared less. We had nothing but Chinese Orientals, and I mean the real Chinese Orientals, not what you find today. And I have some of them still at home now. They're, they're getting to be exhausted, but they are still there. And. Um, I hated uh, cloisonne. Ugh. I have one piece now. Now I realize, after being in China, how <laughs> special cloisonne is. And but one thing that he sent for was a um, Japanese hari coat. It's spelled H A O R I. It's a gentleman's outerwear robe, and they're going to a very festive affair. They would put these over the other kimono or whatever they wore with their... And it had decals here and here on both shoulders. The outside is black silk. They're put together by hand. You open it up. And it's what my mother and I would call Chinese red. Mother had a little fit of that up at our mountain cabin at Mount Hood. She painted during... That was when it was... We had a false log in the wall in the cabin my dad built. It's a big, he built it around a fireplace of a house that had burnt down. Lot 88 at Camp Creek, it's seven miles above Rody, five miles above Rody, seven miles from Gubby. And you, we'd have to walk in during the winter because the roads were covered. But anyway, my father had Port Orford Cedar Log shipped up from Marshfield, and he built this darn house. And he went out in the woods and dragged logs back, like a bended one that he would peel to put on the steps going up the banister. And he split logs to make steps. And it was a balcony, and we all, they had a bed and I had a bed, and it was, they were made out of wood, out of logs, you know. He did it all himself, except that he fell off the roof and he was putting the shakes on and dislocated his shoulder, which was written up in the paper. But mother took plain, Cans. I don't know where she got them. They were cans they would use for canning in a cannery. Where she got them, but they had no labels on them. She painted them all bright Chinese red. Anybody that came up to our cabin, which there were a lot of parties, they got their name painted. And I remember that my dad slid this half log in the dining room open, and that's where he kept the beer, the wine, the, whatever they had. In fact, my husband and I took my mother and our kids when they were real little. We went, took mother, and we went up there, and drove in. It was during the summer, and we, of course, no problem for mother and I to find the cabin. It's the first road as you go in on that Camp Creek Road. It's the last house because they go for miles. WPA did a tremendous job up there in the mountains. They did. They built Timberline Lodge, yeah. and it is beautiful. And they came down through our park area. We're on what they call Camp Creek, and they made sort of big pools 
colder than anything, but we'd go in because it would get hot. When I was small, I was, you know, they built that when I was probably around seven years old. And I remember at age nine or ten, no fear at all, I'd say to my mother, I'm going to go out and go on some of the trails. Fine. I'd take an orange or an apple with me. She never seemed to worry about me. And I'd go down the road, and I remember that I knew where there were a lot of trails where I'd have to straddle a log to get across the creek and go on up. It's sort of like going up to um, <coughs> that mountainous area. If you go 122, I can't quite remember, 41 from 2000 is what. Oh, boy. Yeah. Be, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so you're early 20s. We could not, we had the rationing. Tires, rubber was rationed. We had everything retreaded. Do you remember that? Hearing your family talk about that. I've, I've you heard them talk. Take your tires in to your. Well, what's that big tire place downtown Olympia? Uh, now it's West Schwab. Yeah, Schwab's. Oh, really? Now, you know how you'd go down to Schwab's, for instance, as an example, and say, "Would you please retread? Is it worth retreading, or do you have a good retread?" Rubber had to go for the war effort. We were rationed on sugar. Meat, um, eggs. My mother used to put eggs in a big crock, and I, in some sort of a solution, and you know they just did it because you never knew when you could get fresh eggs. Uh, we couldn't get help out of uh, uh, to pick or to uh, pick the filberts up, and you have to let them fall to the ground, which means then they're ripe enough and take them out of the house. We had to go to Grant, uh, Carver elementary school, which is a little itty-bitty town, sort of a one-stop corner with a couple of stores and that was it. <laughs> now I understand it's quite busy, you know, there's Gresham, is big now, that was just a little town. We used to go through that because we lived 21 miles out of Portland on the Clackamas River because my father was a fisherman and he had two acres right on the river and then he, we had an island in front. So he built a suspension bridge. But because through the years now we have had a lot of cutting of the timber in the watersheds, Clackamas came down and talk about flooding, washed out that whole island and we saw that water come right up which had been a very high bank. My mother was terrified. And when my father died, she sold that place so quick. And, but we had to call and hire the little kids from school to come down and pick nuts for us. Because all the... Everything had gone. Um, everybody had gone into this war effort. Women had gone into the factories. Uh, I worked in steamship. Um, women were working at Boeing. You know, of course, that was what gave women a chance to get ahead because they were shown that they could do things. Now we're getting into the corporate area. They find that women are not completely dumb. <laughs> um, we had silk hose going into the war and they were pretty nice. But nylon was introduced right at the beginning. But nobody could get nylons because it went for the parachutes. The white parachutes the fellows needed. So we get runs. Every once in a while, some store like Myron Frank in Portland, which is long gone, or um, uh, the Bon Marche, Frederick and Nelson, Myron Frank in Portland, Frederick and Nelson in Seattle, and the Bon Marche. Once in a while, they would get a few dozen nylon hose, but they always had somebody who was a good customer. I. I don't remember whether I got them, but even with the silk hose, they get run. So we'd rush to the stores. Your mother could probably tell you this. And these women would sit there, and they had little round, sort of like a plastic egg. You've seen marble eggs, plastic eggs that the kids put Easter things in at Easter time. They would spread the nylon over that very tightly where they could see the run. They had a little needle of some sort and I have no idea how they did it. I would stand there watching them, trying to figure how they did it. They go real fast like that, and they would mend those runs. And that's how we got along when we walked. Or 
When summer came, we got on to Lake Hiccup, which is still available today. Only the ladies put on the makeup on their arms, on their faces. So people who do not want to get uh, the uh, rays today, get sun rays, get sunburn, get too tan. I tan easily, so I never worried about it. But we would put leg makeup on, and it's a real fast job. You put your leg up on the side of the tub and go like this real fast. You'd start down here and work real fast. I got very sharp at it. But the bad thing, and then the, they had seams in the silk hose that went up the back. Do you remember that? Uh -huh. We tried to introduce them again here a while back. Because I worked for Glamour. I represented Glamour magazine in Seattle for Frederick and Nelson's because I was a career gal. And there was a, they asked different career women around the city of Seattle to create a, a, a fashion board. And we had a lot of fun. But they tried to introduce that because women would take soft makeup pencils that must have been, you know, women that make false eyebrows or eyeliner, and they would make the seam up the back of their leg. I never did. I wasn't that conscious of it. But what was bad about it is when we'd come home, you had to wash that out off your legs every night or your sheets were just going to be one grand mess. And that's, you know, I'd come home real tired because I love to go dancing and I spent a lot of time dancing. And I'd have to get into that shower, not to shower particularly, just to get by the faucet and get all that soap up and get rid of it. And that was to look, to try to look like you had nylon. Right, Yeah. right. And you pick out a certain shade that you like real well. We did that. The girls will remember. And now they talk about jitterbugging. I was raised in Portland in a wonderful time in the 40s, the late 30s and 40s, because I was of the class of 44 at Oregon State. That was why I quit and came home to see I wanted to get a job because all the fellows were leaving school. It just wasn't the fun. You'd have these big school dances or the house dances, and there were always fellows there, but it just was emptying slowly but surely. And um, now I just got off of that. What was it? I was gonna. You were saying about that. I'd asked about the, the makeup to be to look like nylon. You said you chose right. different shades and. Oh, jitterbugging. Now I sit back, and I didn't learn how to jitterbug until I must have been in my 60s, by a wonderful surgeon friend of ours. He and his wife, we all went to these big parties in Lakewood where we played golf. And Larry <coughs> knew how to jitterbug. And my husband didn't like to dance, and he, he was very Ivy League, and he would wear white suede, white bucks, you know, with your summer outfits. Oh, yeah. Always had red rubber soles. And that was all still, so you had this exciting teenage. I don't, I don't think the kids today had as much fun as we had. I really don't. Because a lot of things that aren't taboo today were taboo then. We didn't have to worry about drugs. We didn't have to worry about makeup particularly. Um, we just had fun. We had our formal parties out at the country clubs. And it was just loads of fun until the war broke. And then you saw everybody going off, and you wondered who was going to come home. And that was the bad thing. And most of my friends in Portland, where I was raised, as I said, went to the Aleutians, which was pretty rugged duty in those days. Lots of mud, rained all the time. After the war, then the Seabees came in and made more of a base out of Amchitka or Kodiak or any of those places. But they really felt the Japanese were coming in, just like the Japanese that were taken off of Bainbridge Island. And if you ever read the book, Snow Falling on Cedars, was a very good description. And um, Now did you, since your dad dealt with the Japanese trade, did you have Japanese friends that... No, not particularly. He did in the business. And they would always invite my mother and dad to their homes. And mother and dad did. I never went, being a child or a uh, young teenager, I never went. But mother and dad did. Mother came back kind of upset because she, a lot of these were very young women, Japanese 
women that were married to these men, and they had little children. They were really younger than my mother and my dad, and they had these lovely American homes. They all had lovely homes, but they weren't kept the way we Americans did. It was not quite the same. The consulate always made a very large presentation to my father every Christmas made a big presentation and lovely things, which I've given. Uh, I have, a, I remember, a sterling silver cigarette box. The box was sterling. The tray was, te was teak, edged in silver all the way around, and the very top, because, you know, everybody smoked cigarettes in those days. I didn't smoke until my father died because he didn't, he didn't figure ladies smoked. <laughs> and you know, I thought so much of him that I never smoked until after he passed away. And then I quit over 30 years ago. Wow. And I am just glad I did. Because I'm seeing, I have one good friend right now who's been diagnosed with lung cancer. Yeah. And she's not going to do anything about it because it's too late. But anyway, the outside was all edged. And then the top of the lid has beautiful, fine, very fine artwork, like a floral spray or something with a little Japanese lettering. And I gave it to my son. And it's a beautiful piece of art, and he keeps that on his chest of drawers. I have a gold vase in my living room right now that I've carried around with mother and dad for ages. And on the back side, I can tell it's got something in Japanese written, and I never bothered to find out. It probably is a good piece of artwork because the consulate wouldn't give just anything. Right. This is a very solicitous gift. So do you remember, was that hard on your dad then? Because, no. I mean, no. being business with the Japanese and now we're at war with them? No, no, it didn't bother him other than he felt, uh, well, I... I might hurt somebody's feelings. I felt that he felt above them because he felt they were quite, held things to themselves. Now these are the people who had come from the old country to represent their businesses, like Yamashita, which is a big shipping company, still is. And uh, I'm sure they had prisoners of war from, from the United States work for them. But before the war, the only, and we went on the ships, because he did the supercarging when he came down to Portland. And I, I have pictures in my scrapbooks where my dad would go on board ship, and I used to go, this is a little girl. Mother would drive, we had an old Buick. I call it old, it was probably special for them with running boards, because we always went camping every summer. My father, they started when I was six weeks old. And I mean, going up to Eastern Oregon, I've been all over the state, and I laughed when I saw the beautiful Indian Resort, Canada. And what's that little town before you go up there? What's it called? Um, there's a little town. It now has paved streets. Huh. And I cracked up laughing, because we'd gone to um, another resort to play golf first. And I could, um, can't think of the name of it right now. And we had to have something done to the car, and we had to go into this little town. And I said, ye gods, they've got paved streets now. But we, they started camping with me when I was six weeks old. And I learned to tell what a rattler sounded like. But <laughs> here we had this beautiful Canada Lodge. Have you ever been there? No. It's huh? gorgeous. Um, right out there in eastern Oregon, and the one of the tribes owns it, maintains it, and everything, and it's a, a beautiful spot, I think. It's all done in Weyerhaeuser, I think, did a lot of it. But no, my father felt that things were very strained. I think he felt that the Japanese at that time in business never really opened up or committed themselves. It's just so, so. But they liked to hire the person who had the ability and my father was one because he did all the plans for stowing cargo. He also could tell when they came in or how to unload. That's what a supercargo does. And um, 
he had beautiful drawings. And I think he just became very well known on the uh, Portland waterfront. And I felt that when, as I said, we'd go down the street and he'd hear somebody whistle and he would just stop and I'd look around too. I knew it was some longshoreman that knew my dad, remembered him. Mm -hmm. And in one of those articles I read, or he'd even been a dock boss. He'd done longshoring. So that was a facet that I really didn't know. Well, when, but he knew ships. And when, he knew when, the men that worked the ships. When Pearl Harbor happened, did, did he then disassociate with oh, all these? Oh, you bet. He, well, he wasn't working for them then. He had left them oh. several years before war was declared, but he always felt there was something going to happen. He felt an undercurrent just with his relationships in business that they were not too committed. They wouldn't. They won't talk. Come up. Let things off the shoulder or something. They were very closed mouth, but in their body movements, I think, in the way they talked. And even today, with my own husband working with at one time for 14 years with Chinese interests, it's very interesting today to see how they do different things differently than we do. Like sometimes their family are left, say, someplace, and the husband works someplace else. They really don't want the families to detract. We Americans don't do things where our husbands go, our family goes. It's very important. Mm -hmm. It really is. Mm -hmm. Even though they feel that we don't have a family car, what I see is there are so many activities for kids today, growing up, high school even, college, there are so many diversions that when the family, when I went down to Georgia this summer, six lanes on the freeway, one way, it's, you know, and the airplanes, the, the traffic patrol people don't go up and down the freeway, they are spaced periodically. I saw them. Why are they waiting there? And Kim would say, they are there in case there's an accident. Hmm. And they keep the flow of the traffic going. And then if there's an accident, they know exactly where to go. But what we noticed, when the kids come home or the mothers are picking them up, they're going out one door as the dads are coming in. That's why families aren't in Australia. Huh. And my son came over, and he and I were walking in. You know, it was a, uh, well, one we, we would drive, we couldn't go skiing because we didn't have tires. I mean, people had just so much tread, and you got special allotment of gasoline to go to work and to back uh, to your home. And I'm sure that my father had gas coupons. And now, what was on the alcohol I was telling you about? My, I know that my dad made beer, made root beer and regular beer and wine huh. down in the basement of our home in East Moreland, which is a very nice residential area in Portland on the east side. And um, I remember my grandmother reported him to the police as being a long-standing joke in the family. We <laughs> thought it was absolutely hilarious. Huh. And that was in the 30s. And then somewhere along in the war, they couldn't just, you couldn't go to a restaurant and have a drink. As I said, we went to the Olympic Hotel to go dancing, and the fellows had to bring their bottles in a paper sack, sort of what the kids under 18 do now, you know, or under 21. Because I know in Utah they have private clubs where mm -hmm. you have to you yeah. keep your bottle right. and, and do right. that. Now, what about your your husband in World War II? Uh, how was he tied? Because you had a lot of photographs and, and yeah, tied him with the atomic bomb. He was a bomb. student at the University of Washington. Like I said, he uh, they took, what was it, two years uh, required ROTC for graduate credits. And the war broke because he had graduated from Olympia High School when it was over right there on Capitol Way and is no more because they used to go to the Brown Derby for lunch and uh, he uh, was he went to school he would have been out of the class of 42 so far from that would have been what 39 he graduated from Olympia High School in 39 
Actually, we, he, had, he had gone to Lewis and Clark in Spokane. His father was made state supervisor of banking. He was a Republican, but it was Governor Martin, a Democrat. My father-in-law was a, a banker, and during the Depression, he went around and had to close banks and things like that. As a result, he would never buy a home. They always rented because he saw too many people losing their homes. Wow. He was very conservative. They rented a home right here on Capitol Way. I see it all the time when I'm going downtown. And uh, uh, George went to Olympia High School his senior year because Pops got transferred over here to Olympia. Well, George didn't know a soul. And the, his very best friends were on the golf team because my husband had played golf since he was a 12-year-old and was on, played for Lewis and Clark, and so he came over. And the only way he made friends was with a Jack Phillips, who now lives in Spokane and was a writer and an editor for the Spokesman Review. He's now retired. Uh, Pete Schmidt, because my husband was about a year older than all these fellows, and then when he decided to stay one year longer to adv have advanced ROTC, then he graduated with his group of 43. And so Pete Schmidt was another one. Uh, gee, I wish I'd brought those names. There's a lot of names uh, that I know of that I've got written down from here. And he had a wonderful time playing high school golf. And then he went on to the university and he played, he lettered at the University of Washington and was in the Alpha Dell House, which I think has now succumbed. But lots of friends, and I would like to bring this letter to you by this Jack Wilson from Seattle. You should have that. And um, So where did, where did he end up serving then when he... Well, he came out here to, Fort, to McCord because he enlisted in the Air Corps and he got his second lieutenancy, but he had to go to um, uh, officer candidate school down in Miami. That's where they all went. And then from Miami, that's when you saw him standing up straight, you know. <laughs> um, from there, they they spent a little time in Orlando, and I don't. I think some of those pictures of the big marches were out in some place in Orlando, which is you know where we all go now if you want to go to Disneyland. And he got. He said it was quite changed when we went there in '83. Between we drove around a lot, and we uh, went to Disneyland and Disney World, and he wanted to see Miami, and he looked at Orlando and he said, boy, this has changed. From there he went to Harvard because he wore glasses and you couldn't fly. He wanted to fly worse than anything, but he wore glasses. You couldn't fly in those days with glasses. Now they've got contacts, and they can do it, plus everything else, surgery now. <laughs> you can do those things. So. He went to Harvard Business School, became a statistician. The next thing he knew, he was heading for the Philippines. They played an awful lot of poker. When he was here in Olympia, I still have to this day his penny, his Indian head penny collection. I have all of his marbles from, I suppose, started in Spokane and Timbuktu because his father transferred constantly from one bank to another. Even Cleotis, do you know where that is? Uh-uh. <laughs> it's out in farmland out in eastern Washington. And they lived, their family lived above a bar. Uh, um, it wasn't called a bar, it was called a tavern in those <laughs> days. And his mother ordered food from a, very good re uh, from a very good grocer in Spokane, and it came down by train to Cleotis. <laughs> and, uh, but they, and he went, he went, Cleotis, and then they went to Ritzville, and so they really covered it. And um, so anyway, George went to the Philippines. He never got back from then. This is, will be sort of interesting. Then they, he was sent to Tinian, and that was really very hush-hush, because this is where the atom bomb, the Enola Gate, was to take off. And my husband was one of those who kept all of the figures. They had a lot of other sorties that went out from Tinian. 
Uh, he used to talk about it. I didn't really pay too much attention except with regards to the atom bomb because he got to know so many of the crew and he was keeping the figures. And it was interesting to him too because they had a deep hole in the ground, nothing crude. It was they had something that brought the bomb up and they practiced taking off time and time again. They would go out over the ocean, come back. And this is in the Marianas. This is why the kids today should really look. We used to read all the books that were being written by the correspondents from during World War II. I think I belong to the Book of the Month Club and I read so many of those books. Now if you can get this Rain of Rain, which is the full story of the atom bomb starting in New Mexico with the scientists and all the hush-hush. Now it can be told. I didn't even know what was going on down there in New Mexico. And I didn't know about it until I ran the video, which is available. And to see all of this work that was done and how they kept it from anybody else knowing about it is beyond me. Um, but in the meantime, my husband watched this because if they'd had an accident, it would have blown up the island or anything else. And they did it time after time after time again to wait for the right time to go. And then if you watch this, you'll see them take off. And it, uh, the gentleman that was the captain of that flight is still alive, and even to this day. And my own father felt that all we had to do was to drop a bomb on Tokyo because it was made of paper, everything, in design, walls sliding back and forth. He felt that that would be in the Tokyo, and of course Tokyo wasn't bombed right away, but later, and they did have a lot of damage. Um, the only time he got home was an R&R &R in the Philippines, and of course this was after MacArthur took over. So they could go home, but he didn't get home from the time he left. In uh, 43, he didn't come back to 45, and this is important because, but then when he did, he go, and they have a beautiful resort, I've never been in the Philippines, called Baguio. It's up in the mountains, and they have a golf course up there, a club. And he had a hole in one where he got the clubs. I'm sure that he, that he had to rent them or something. But he had a hole in one in Baguio, and that really got his morale up. And uh, also, and then he went back to, of course, he was on tinning. That was just a small R&R. &R. And the other funny thing, he kept talking. He sent these pictures home. They always were opening an officer's club. Now there were, yes, sir, the Red Cross women were there. I heard about them because when I had, we had a daughter, we looked for a short name. This is a joke in the family. And my husband came up with the name Kay. We both liked it. I thought that was, you know, out of the top of his head. Then I find later that one of the Red Cross girls that he got to know quite well, her name was Kay. So we tease him to this day. <laughs> Unfortunately, he's gone now. but. My daughter thinks that is absolutely hilarious because we've read all these books like The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit and so forth and all these things that went on. Uh, but anyway, it was, really, it was really funny. And in watching this video of the Enola Gate, they did bring out that every group on the island, they had different groups of airplanes and they would go out on what they called sorties. And so all of these groups had their own um, officer's club, because that's all there were. And, and he looked like he opened up every one that he had <laughs> been to. But that made him a hail fellow well met. And he did that the rest of his life, and we loved him dearly, because he was a very quiet, unassuming man. He didn't have a lot to say, he would smile, but whatever, he, he was a listener, not a talker. I was the talker. Wonderful golfer, and um, he always thought he wanted to have his ashes. 
sprinkle out on Puget Sound, but instead we took him, his ashes. He had two holes in one uh, on a golf course in our area. It's against the law. And I asked him one day what he thought about maybe sprinkling his ashes around a green. Now, I never had a hole in one, but I got into some very deep traps right by this particular green. And so I have told my family to take my ashes and put them in this very deep <laughs> trap, and somebody will get me out. And that's just been a joke, but we did do this. and. Um, we felt that he was greatly amused, shaking his head and thinking, no, he wouldn't be caught doing something like that. But he knew we were doing it with much love. But anyway, when he came home, he came home in 45 in San Francisco, and uh, he entered civilian life. But he made him, he still stayed in the military as a reserve officer, involuntary, inactive reserve status. And guess what happened in 1950? We had the Korean War. And he was called back to duty in 1951. Wow. He went back to Accord. We were in Aberdeen when he got orders. He worked for GMAC, and we went back to McCard. I hadn't really known any of the Air Force during World War II. My, most of the friends I'd gone to school with all had gone into the Navy. So I thought, oh dear. And so we ended up in his orders from McCard, sent him to Bong Airfield, and he didn't know where in the heck Bong Airfield, but I did. His family were living back in Spokane. His father was president of a bank there. And I said that used to be Galena during World War II. Then it was changed to Bong Airfield, and then it would change to Fairchild. And that is where he was sent. I said, how lucky can you be? Well, that wasn't the end of the story. So we are reporting to Fairchild Air Force Base. His family just live a few miles at Spokane. Uh, it was interesting to watch the different groups of men who had been all through World War II, lots of flight officers, a lot of them from Pennsylvania. All these fellows had been through World War II and they were coming in with their heels down, down. They really didn't want to have to come in. I knew of many officers, including my brother-in-law, who was a naval of a uh, officer, as a flight officer. Uh, he has this, uh, the uh, Navy Cross, which he never had told us about, or I didn't know about. And I came across it one day, and I said, who belongs to the Navy Cross. I recognized it, knowing a lot of people in the Navy. And it was my brother-in-law. He was from New Orleans, and he flew off of the aircraft. And he went off of one of his ship, the ship he was on, with a two-seat plane that could drop a bomb. I don't know what the name. He probably could tell you. I don't know. And he and the fellow was behind him, he was piloting, and the fellow was the one who was going to look through the scope and drop this bomb. Their orders were to go out, and there was some shipping coming in, the South Pacific, and they were to go out and scuttle one of these freighters. It was a Navy ship or a freighter or something. It was a Japanese ship. He took off from the airplane carrier out where he was going out over the jungle and going to come around up behind the ship. As he's out over the jungle, his radio went alive. His own ship was under Japanese fire. They said, Ditch, don't come back. Well, he said to himself, we are not going to ditch. I refused to do it. He didn't tell them. He just 
turned the radio off and went out over the jungle, came up behind this big ship with a great big funnel and they aimed it and went right down the funnel, flew off and blew the whole ship up. And he came back to his own ship while it was under fire and landed and saved the aircraft. Mm -hmm. He was probably about 22, 23 years old. <laughs> you had to be very, very brave to do that. Wow. And um, he, is, he still belonged to the, that was the point I wanted to bring up. All of these flyers made the mistake. They all loved to fly so well. So they stayed in the, in the reserve. And my brother-in-law would make bombing runs on the ferry, the Kirkland Ferry, before we had 520 to take us across Lake Washington. He would make a bombing run from Sandpoint Air Station Naval Air Station over to Kirkland and back because he would take my husband and they would do bombing runs just for pure fun where they had to put so many hours in. Well, when when uh, Korea happened, uh, everybody was trying to reserve or uh, resign their commissions. Some made it and some got called real quick. So we had a lot of our veterans that were in the Korean War and there was one who was a land officer, and um, when he came back, and that was a very brutal battle over there in their frigid winters, and he got very badly shot up in the face and had to have a lot of plastic surgery. He has since passed away, but <clears throat> when I went to the officers' wives' club meeting, I couldn't believe it, these women getting up and giving you know, their officer's commission, they had every right to do that, to be very proud. But I got up and said, well, we were uh, Captain so-and-so, and we were in voluntary, in, in voluntary reserve, which meant they could only keep us for 18 months. And when, and that was the point. He was based at Fairchild. We made some wonderful friends. We had other friends there that were from Spokane, in fact, one of the graduates in the University of Washington were very close friends of ours to this day. He, grand, he graduated cum laude. He was a stat officer and he was in there. And what they would do on their noon hour were to play bridge for dimes. And then it got so his orders would come in from FIFE, F-I-F-E, which was Japan orders for more officers to come over and so forth and so on. What the reserve officers did, who were now on active duty in a way, they would match their overseas points. How long had they been overseas during World War II? And since my husband had been over, say, three to, well, it was more than three years because he spent time in Miami, spent time in Orlando, time at Harvard in Boston, before he actually went overseas, and plus that time is what why he didn't go, but they would be matching, you know, points. How many points did you have? And they'd go around, and that's good. Plus, one night we went to the officers' club for like a New Year's Eve or some festive party, and uh, we were there. We had our reserve table with, say, a large group of our friends, the commanding officer's table, no one was there. And uh, the time got late, and I know it was well past midnight. And a group of the young flight officers and their wives came in. And there was no table to be had. Everything was taken, and they were feeling no pain and just having a wonderful time. They wanted to come and continue party and dancing and whatnot. So somebody gave them the commanding officer's table because they didn't think the commanding officer would show up that night. It was after midnight. And guess what happened? The commanding officer and his party moved in. And here is what happened. One of the wives, one of these young wives, was president of the officer's wives club to boot. But every one of those flight officers left for fief the next morning. That is when I didn't think I would make a very good officer's wife. 
when I had a baby there, I was pregnant when we came into the service, and I heard a lot of conversation about the OBGYN men in Spokane, and I'd hear all this, and then we'd go out to the base, and gee, they had good OBs out there, and it was only going to cost me about $8.25 to have this baby. And it was real interesting, because since it was my first, I didn't know how to compare it to anything, so it didn't bother me. We were, it, they looked like, well, like Quonset huts, military. I don't remember much about any privacy having that baby, particularly. I didn't care. But I remember driving out from Spokane to Fairchild, and I happened to know that our car was on empty. And I thought, oh dear God. <laughs> but we made it out there. It was quite early in the morning, like two or three. And I walked in to the hospital, which was a Quonset hut, and some enlisted man was there reading. Who was going to be walking in at that time in the morning? And he sort of lifted my, he hardly lifted his head, and he said, yes, what can I do to help you? And I said, I think I'm going to have a baby. Can you tell me where I go from here? And we thought that was pretty funny. And of course, I was there for a number of hours before any action. Then, where we young new mothers were all in, if any of these girls think that if they're in with somebody else, and this shouldn't be, we military wives were in one great big Quonset hut with umpteen women having babies. And um, so, but it, Eight dollars and I think it was eight dollars and seventy-five cents, and it was well <laughs> worth it. Except a few number of years later, we had two more children. Both were born at Sacred Heart Hospital, which is a regular, normal hospital. So our daughter wanted to know where she was born. It <coughs> she said. So we she did. Did I have one last question? Did uh, did your husband understand? what he was a part of, I mean, with the atomic bomb? Or, or oh, was yes. it so hush-hush that they didn't even really know? Oh, yeah, they knew. It wasn't talked about particularly, but they all knew it was big. They knew it was a big bomb, and they knew it was going to go to Japan. And when I got to Nagasaki, I didn't see as much destruction there because it was on the other side of the mountain. We didn't go in there. All I want to do is to go up. We hired a cab driver to take us around Nagasaki, and being an opera buff, I wanted to go up into <laughs> Never Never Land to the top of the mountain where I could see the harbor where the story of Madame Butterfly was written, which I'm sure uh, that was just a story, but it was it's a lovely opera. And, uh, and Nagasaki is a lovely town and lovely people. All the, I felt so welcome when we were in China as well as Japan. I never felt anything, even in Europe. The people that were our age that we ran into, because we, we stayed in Zimmers in Germany, we stayed well, wherever we went, we stayed in what you'd call what, uh, we didn't stay in the big ones where the kids stayed, but we stayed in Zimmers, or uh, I keep thinking of that, or in, in uh, Spain, what was it called, in Portugal. Um, I can't remember what they called it. Of course, and they had the big castles that changed, but the Orient, um, we never felt, I, and of course I never did, because I went to a high school. We were already integrated. Now this is in 19, um, I graduated in 1940, so I started school in thir high school in 36. I went to Washington High School, which is no longer, it's on the east side. We had Chicanos, we had Blacks, we had Orientals, we had Syrians. Governor, what was his name? He was in high school with me. Governor Atia was in high school with me. Uh, the Cartosians, who are well known in the rug industry. Navarre, or Navarre's, her name would be it, uh, across the street from me. And her dad would take us we had a choice of either going to Lincoln on the west side or staying on the east side 
and going to Washington High School, which meant if I, when I came home, I had to take about two different buses hmm. to get home because we lived in East Moreland. And actually, the president of Reed College now lives in the Cartosian, which is house, which was right across the street from me. We were so integrated, and I'm, I can see now what maybe the teaching professionals were trying to get through to my own children's generation because they hadn't been exposed to this. I always, I already had been exposed, including our gays. And I grew up with absolutely no discriminatory. I just never thought color or what one's belief was was a big deal. And we're all Americans, and as I've learned, this is what has made America. And if you look around now, look at what Governor Bush or President Bush elect. His cabinet's going to be the only thing he hasn't appointed an Oriental. We have some wonderful Japanese. We have wonderful Chinese. And they're very very smart, and they're wonderful people. I happen to know a very wonderful um, anesthesiologist from Scripps Memorial, who's now at Deaconess in Spokane. He's Chinese. He married the Swedish-Norwegian daughter of very close friends of mine. And I'm thinking, that's going to be interesting. She's a strawberry blonde. Her father is a Norwegian, very stubborn, in and out, a lovely man. Her mother is also a strawberry blonde Swedish girl. And I thought, and I love these people this young couple, they're uh, uh, my children's generation. They have two of the most beautiful daughters you ever want to see. Mm -hmm. One is a top soccer player for Lewis and Clark, and the other is a ballerina <coughs> who came over to Cornish School. 